Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon. Welcome to week nine, uh, Alice Weekly Workshop. This week we will be focusing on variables. Um, if you are just joining us now and you missed all the other ones, this is probably one of our more advanced lessons. So it's a good idea to go back and watch some of the previous lessons to build up to this one because we'll be making use of a lot of those. And with that, I'm just going to go ahead and start sharing and jump us on in. All right, again, just as a reminder, all of the lessons that we're covering on this workshop are in our resource section, Alice 3 Lessons. So you'll see many of the other ones that we have covered. And down here we have using variables. The workshop we're gonna cover this week, I'm gonna go through the lessons and I'm gonna walk through a bunch of how to's. Uh, this is one that is slated to have more of a facilitation guide added to it and a ex tutorial exercise, just because I think it's one of our more important ones for moving on to especially next week's lesson on game design and things like that. So we will be going through well, the presentation found on that page. So first let's talk about what a variable is. So a variable is a name location on your computer's memory where a value can be stored. The type of data stored in the variable is defined by the data type. Again, we have a much smaller short PowerPoint presentation or lesson on data types. Uh, if you don't know what we're talking about with data types, might be a good idea to pop over there and just give that one a quick peruse. Um, we'll go over it a little bit today and we also went through it in some previous lessons. Um, so this helps the program a lot the right amount of space for the data to be stored. So obviously if it's just a text string or a whole number, it's different than sort of all of the data around an object or things like that. It allows the program to check that the data type will match with what's being requested. So by setting that data type, whether it's a whole number or a Boolean, aka two false, or sort of a gallery object, um, it will help us know that that is when we try to use that variable somewhere or access that variable that the type of data that's going to come out of it is going to work for where we're trying to use it. So that's sort of the last point of informing the computer of the operations that are allowed to perform with that variable. So again, an object sort of like a Alice or something like that, if we're using that as a variable, then you know we're allowed to do a lot of things that are related to moving an object, turning an object, and things like that. If it's just a text string, it wouldn't have those same types of um, options for performing on that variable. And then the big thing about a variable is the value inside of that. So we save something, we can update and change that during the execution of our program. So what are they used for? They are used for short-term storage, storage. So some things in Alice, uh, such as arithmetic expression, arithmetic expressions, will store the result for you to immediately use them. Some of our control structures that we've watched in the past. Um, We'll set up a variable to then be able to process through a loop. So when we did like the wave and things like that, where we're trying to uh, pass in the next object and then move through our sort of array of objects in that, um, the number of times. So long-term storage can be things that we want to save and track for later use. Uh, these variables can have the data stored in them changed as needed. This could be things like collected items, we're gonna go over timekeeper and some other things today. So, you know, the time that has passed, um, win states when we get into game design documents next week, um, you'll use a lot of that. So like, did you win, did you lose? Um, what is the health of something? Those types of things are things that we might wanna only access over time and update as we go through the program, not just set up and immediately use. So when we create a variable, you know, declare is sort of the terminology for that. So when we declare or create them, there's a couple of different places in Alice that we can set them up. Uh, where you set up that variable or declare that variable will affect both the type of data that can be used and then where you can access them. So um, as a, we, if you went through our using parameters um, lesson when creating custom procedures, or even just when we're talking about um, some of our built-in procedures, a parameter is a variable. Um, it allows you to pass that data uh, from outside to in. So when we talked about that greeting and things like that, uh, the code where you use that was at the scene level in the my first method. 
where you wanted to use the data that you stored was inside a biped class. And so that parameter allowed us to pass that data from the scene level down into the biped procedure. Uh, we can also set it as a object property. So declaring a property variable that is part of a class definition. These variables will be accessible in all methods of the instance of that class. So we'll show a little example later, but the idea being that if we create a variable on say the biped or the object level, so Thor, um, those variables will be accessible just within that class or the instances of that class, but we'll have some unique abilities to do some things that will be helpful for you. You can also set up a variable just in your inline coding, so using a code statement. So if you declare a variable using a code statement in a method, so whether it's at the scene or the biped level or wherever you might do it, uh, that variable will only be accessible in that uh, procedure or function that you've written. It will only be available after the point that you set it up, otherwise your program won't be aware of it. And then we've seen a bunch of examples, whether we've talked about it or not, of the variable inside a control structure. So declaring a variable inside of a control structure for some control structures, Alice will force you to declare them. So those were the ones like uh, the um, examples that use an array, so for each in and those types of things where you've set up a variable array that had the objects that you added to it that then are substituted into that control structure. Uh, again, if you set another variable up or declare one within, say, an if else conditional or something like that, uh, it will only be accessible within that control structure and the, the information you store there won't be accept, accessible outside of that. So how do we set up a variable in Alice? Uh, one of them is adding it to the class. So going back, we haven't spent a lot of time in the yellow tab, but we'll do a little bit of that today where it defines that class. So in here, you see that what we do is we set it up as a scene property. So if you click on the add scene property, it will pop up this add scene property window. Um, you can create a constant or a variable for what we're talking about today. You will set it as is variable, variable field. Declaring it in code. So back down on the bottom where we have our control structure list. So the do in order is where we did all of those things up till now. There is the one on the end that is called variable. If you drag that into your procedure function, uh, you can set it up in line. Again, going back to what we were talking about earlier, if you set it up inside of this um, code, it will only be accessible inside that particular procedure or method or function um, and only after you uh, declared it. This is the example that we were talking about, so of a for each in loop. Uh, when you're creating that, so the for each in, you are actually setting the data type, so the item type of the whole number. Uh, you are naming that variable, and then we have set it as an array, so then you are adding asks things to it. And so that for each in variable, as you see in what is constructed above, becomes the, the one that allows you to pass in the next um, item from the array, store it, and then use it in the for each in loop. Selecting the data type. So again, checking out data type. Our default one, or well, like the ones that you see in that first dropdown that Alice has accessible are decibel numbers, whole numbers. We've got the Boolean for the true false. We've got text string. If you click on gallery class, you can select from our inheritance tree. So it can be all the way up from the scene down to a, an, an object instance class. So a gallery class object will not be available as a data type for available as being added to a specific object class such as biped. Um, again, this list will sort of change depending on where you're building it. So that will populate based on what, will, what you can add into that uh, data type. So obviously a joint data type will not be available at the scene class um, and those are in it as a box or things that don't have them. Naming the variable. This goes back to all of our sort of other naming conventions in Alice. Since you are actually creating code under the hood, uh, the same things apply for camel casing. So no special characters uh, such as question marks. Um, if important to name it as something that makes sense. So in the top one, we have sort of a Boolean variable that would be created that is, is active. So that can be true or false. So it would kind of make sense um, in the bottom one, num talks. Um, but anyway, 
Same things apply, use camel casing, so lowercase for the first word, uppercase to delineate if you're using multiple words, no spaces, things like that. Um, most variables have, variables have to have a value when you set them up, so an initializer. So we can't just leave it empty. Uh, this is something where you may replace it with something immediately after you set it up or have it uh, populated from somewhere else. But so that's the thing, we talked about the value type on the top. So in that first example, the value type was Boolean. We've named it as is active. The initializer is then read, and since it is a Boolean, it has to be true or false. So you need to set uh, whether it is true or false when your program starts. Again, you can edit this later as with everything else or change it to be more complicated. Difference one below is you see that if it's a decimal number type, the initializer will then have to be something of that data type. So once you've actually created it, if we're talking about the scene level, you will see it written out as first the um, data type. So inside the hexagon, so you see Boolean, you see the name of the variable is active and you see the initializing value. So in that case, it's true. In the talk and say one, you see that there's the data type decimal number, the variable name numtalks, and then the initializing value of one. Again, we talked about how uh, what you were really doing when you were creating that parameter uh, back when we were doing custom procedures and uh, parameters is that you are creating a variable so that variable words, they then can be used to replace other values in your code or to pass that data. Uh, this is a, one of the cases where you do not need to initialize it because you will actually, you know, when you use that procedure, is when you will be asked to add the value to it. So using a variable. Uh, once you've set up a variable, whether it's sort of local, at the scene level, those types of things, uh, you can use it in any of the places where that data type is accessible, um, minus our sort of short discussion of, depending on where you put the variable, it will only be available within that class um, parent child class. Um, as you see in that top example, uh, we have the decimal number move distance variable uh, set up at the very top. So that means that when we access a move further down below, when we're cascading through those, when the whole number, well, when the decimal number value is asked for for the amount of the move distance, you'll see that the variable shows up at the very bottom of that one. So saying that this is now a a value that can be substituted in there. There is a couple of different ways to do it. So it'll either show up here and that lets you know that it is accessible. The other is on the bottom right where you see it being done. You can also drag it. So if you declare the variable in code that you can see, much like we used in the control structures so the for each in, you can also drag that variable to where you want it to replace. So in that example, we have selected the move distance variable and you see that the little black boxes show up in all of the other decimal number values to say that these are places that you could actually take that variable and replace it. So one of the big things about using a variable is to actually change the value of it. So that instead of it being something constant, you can make code that will let it change. The major way that you do this is you use the control structure at the bottom that is assigned. So assigning the variable a new value. Um, there is different ways that once you've done that, that much like others uh, in Alice, the default will ask you to you know, drag in one of these uh, existing numbers, a custom decimal number, if you already have another variable that maybe you want to use for that assigning. Um, by default, you'll want to set one of those up. A lot of times when you're using variables, you'll want to replace that sort of default value with a function or a arithmetical expression or something like that. And so we'll show you a little bit about doing that. Once a variable exists, there is both the assigning it, but there is also the ability to use set and get procedures and functions to either change that. So the assign is one way to do it. The other is in the procedures. So this was a, um, Procedure the set set alien property variable. 
And so if I drag that out, this is another way to assign that variable. If I am trying to access the data that has been saved in that variable, uh, you can use this function for get alien property variables. This is another way to uh, access, so using functions and procedures to access and set variables that are set up in a different class than where you were um, trying to access them. So it automatically creates a procedure and a function for the variable when you do it. So these were ones where once we created that variable, property variable or alien property variable, uh, these were then accessible in these places. So again, just to reiterate, the get function uh, will return the valuable because remember variable, remembering that functions are used to get data, procedures are used to do something. So the set procedure in this case isn't having anybody animate, but is allowing you to change that variable. So we're gonna revisit the location of the variable just because this one can be confusing where you might set up a variable that you wanna use and then not see it elsewhere. So also reasons for why you might wanna set them up in these places. So a scene variable, the scene is the parent object that manages all of the other objects. So scene being the top level. You can use um, through properties and things like that. This relationship allows the scene to manage, set and get other objects variables. This is sort of a one-way relationship though. So uh, variables that are set at a lower level or you will not be able to set scene variables from within say the biped class or things like that. For other classes to access variables of a scene, you will need to pass them as parameters. So again, that was one where if you um, think of those parameters and how you might also want to use them for variables is you might want to pass data into those from the scene level. To pass it back out, you can actually create your own custom functions or use those get functions that we showed. So the alien, um, that variable was set at the alien. If we wanted to set that variable from the scene level, we have to do it through that Alice or through the alien. If we want to return that data back out to the scene level, we have to use that function as opposed to just accessing the variable. So the gallery class, gallery class property variables can be accessed and managed by the parent scene class. These variables will also be inherited by any subclasses. Each instance of the gallery class will have its own unique version of the variable. I'm definitely gonna show an example of this when we get done talking through these slide decks. Uh, examples of this would be uh, for games, one might be that you have every, every biped, you want to have a health or something like that. If I create that health variable at the biped class, it is then something that extends the biped class. So any biped that I add, uh, whether it be Thor or something like that, Thor, um, Freya, will then inherit uh, that variable, but their own individual version of that variable. So they can all be managed separately. This is one that is definitely easier to just sort of show, um, to show, see how that one actually works. The object class, object class property variables will be accessible to the specific object class um, and the scene class, but not to that sort of intermediary gallery class. Each instance of the object will have its own unique version of that variable. So remembering that the Thor class is not that specific Thor, it is you could have an army of Thors going back to our custom procedures one. So even though it seems like you're setting up that variable on Thor, you're really setting it up for any Thor. So if you had 100 Thors, they would all have a separate variable for that. So examples in Alice of how we might want to do this. So here is a Mad Libs example. I hope I don't get sued for the, the trademark, but we could do something where we set up at the very beginning of this that we want to have variables for the text string for a whole number if you're not aware of what Mad Libs are. It's sort of the one where I ask you a bunch of questions. So give me a verb, give me a noun, give me a number, give me a sound, those types of things. And then I plug those into a text below and then read it back to you for some hilarity. Um, in this case, the example we have, we've used the, the ability to create a local variable. So the first one is text string. It is the variable that is created as animal noise. And then we've used a function that says get string from user and what does the cow say? We can do that for a number of creations of local variables. So dragging the variable in, creating the variable, 
And then once we use that function to get it from the user, we're storing it in that variable that is called animal noise or jump number or things like that. And then we are dragging it down into our code below. So then the cow says the variable animal noise that we've gotten from the user. The, there is then a count loop where we've used the number that we've gotten from the user for like how many times the cow is going to jump. And so this is an example of, I've realized that I want to have something where I get information from the user. I need to store that for later use. And so we've gone through the idea being that instead of having us ask exactly when we are using it, uh, we want to be able to store that and use it later so it doesn't keep interrupting the flow of the program. Timers and score variables are something that is um, often used in LS for games. And so in this case, we're looking at the time elapsed and the sort of set score ones. So these are global variables that you might want to create at the scene level because then you will want to create custom procedures or something like that to increment it. This is also an example of using uh, a combination of an arithmetic expression to update it. So we have created a time variable or a timer variable. And then we see that we're using an assign statement to say this timer is now equal to the current value, so of timer minus one, which is just taking one away each time it happens. So going back to our lesson on events, the time elapsed event listener will listen to the computer timer and each time a second goes by based on the, the value that we put in there, it's going to trigger. And every time that triggers, we wanna update that variable by subtracting one. And then the next line is just how we are visualizing that. So we're having the cow tell us that. Another option would be to attach something like a score variable that increments every time you click something, run into something, collect something, uh, answer a question correct. So in this case, we've created a score variable and then we're using that mouse clicked event. So each time the mouse is clicked on the cow, you're seeing that we're using the assign to uh, take that and set the score, which is taking the current value of the score and adding one to it. And again, to visualize that update, we're having the cow tell you the score. World states. So another one that we will definitely make use of next week would just be, and we, we showed examples of this for, you know, if I am looking at something that it will do things and other things like that. Uh, you can use a variable that can be changed based on the uh, things happening in the world. So in this case, we have a game is active. So in that case, all of these things that will start the timer, that will allow you to score, that will have those things happen are only happening when the game is true. The game is active, it's true. This is ways that we can sort of gate when somebody comes into the world that we want them to you know, read directions or something like that before the game just starts. It's a way to stop the game when they've either won or lost and so setting sort of a global Boolean variable that then switches on and off other mechanics is a great way to sort of set up um, levels, access to things, and sort of start and stop and resets. So some things to think about when you're doing this. Um, if it doesn't seem like you're gonna be able to be able to put something in there, things to watch for is that you have a data type mismatch. Um, some of them can be less obvious than others for you know, the difference between a decimal number and a whole number. Um, S thing parameter can be accepted as a biped. So if it is higher up on that sort of inheritance in our gallery, um, you can then use a piece of data that falls into that. So a biped, quadruped, or other things can be replaced into a parameter or a variable that is an S thing because it is uh, a version of that. Um, but a decimal parameter can accept a whole number because a whole number is inherently a decimal, but the reverse of that won't work. So if you've set up the parameter as a biped, then we can't accept every S thing because what if it's a quadruped and we need to use joints that the biped doesn't have um, a whole number can't accept the decimal because what if the decimal is 1.01, .01, the whole number is not expecting that extra 0.01 data. So can't store it, can't access it. 
Uh, one trick on that is if you're trying to convert something that could be a decimal to a whole number is we do have a rounding function to convert that. So if you are doing something that's going to return some fractional number, uh, but you want to use it for just rounding off to how many times a count loop will happen or something like that, you can use this round to integer. Um, and there's some other things there that will allow you to change data types. All right. That is the end of the presentation portion of this. Uh, I'm going to jump into building some worlds to show how this actually functions, but I'll pause here in case there are questions thus far. So here we are in Alice, and we are going to create um, first a timer. It's just something that is a pretty good example of all of this and shows sort of different ways, and I'll migrate us through different levels of complexity of it. Um, one of the things I'm going to do first is add a shape text model. So variables are inherently underneath the hood, right? So they don't have a visual representation of them changing. And so one thing you have to think about is, is this something that you want to make visible in your world? Or is it just something that you will track behind the scenes to use to do other things? For this example, I'm going to use a text model to showcase it. We're gonna first say that we're gonna set a timer up to just counts down from 10. We don't want the value to open up as hello. I have it start as 10 seconds. All right, so here's our visual representation there, just the number 10. If we come back to the code side, um, here is the scene activation and add time listener. So the time listener is a refresher, is one that will just fire every single time uh, the internal clock of the computer passes this duration. We'll go with a one second. So this time, or this event listener will trigger every second uh, that the program is running. We are going to do a local assignment of a variable just to show you this. I'm going to change it later, but you drag the variable up into here. And so let's say we want it to be a whole number. If you wanted your timer to be more of a stopwatch and have seconds and things like that, you could alter the how often this triggers and then uh, what value. We're going to set this up as whole number. We're going to call this time. And we are going to initialize it to match our first one that says 10 seconds. So our timer will start, I'll put an R on this one. Our timer will be a 10 second countdown. We now have a variable that is a whole number that has a starting value of 10. The next thing we need to do is each time this triggers, we want to change the value of that. So we're gonna use the assign, we're gonna drag that underneath it. And now we have our timer value, which is set to 10. Oh, this may or may not work. Um, yeah, this won't work. Let me drag that back. At the scene level, we will create our variable. So we will add a scene property that is the timer. Again, we'll go with whole number. We will set the custom whole number to 10. So now we have a whole number variable that is set to the value of 10. Back to here, we have still set up the one that will trigger every one second. And here is where we're going to, each time this triggers, we want to change the value of the timer. So we see that there is this timer. Uh, there is now the variable of timer. You can call the variable with inside the assignment of that variable. So I'm actually gonna do that. So this would essentially just update it to the same value it already is, but we wanna use math to increment that. So we have the math section of our extended version of setting up this value. And we're gonna do this timer minus one. All right, so ultimately this is now going to trigger each time. It's gonna take the value of that current variable and we're gonna subtract one from it. If I run the program, Again, nothing happens because this is really just a text model that has the value 10. It's not in any way hooked up to it. This text model, and let me go back to scene because I should have named it something better. Um, text model, I'm going to rename to timer display. All right, now if we come back here, we have the timer display. When we have a text model, we have a set value in the text of that. So we can drag that over here. And if we hit hello, 
Uh, if I run this now, when that triggers, it's gonna set it to low. That's not what we want to have happen. Um, by default, it will only show text variations of, but in Alice, you can extend a text to accept other data types of decimal numbers, whole numbers, and even some of these other gallery classes and things like that. In this case, we want to append it to say hello, whole number, and use the variable. So now the timer will display that value. Uh, I'll run this program so you can see it. The challenge is now it says hello, nine, eight. It's updating each time, and so it is counting down. Uh, unfortunately, that's not really what we want. The other option is I could set this to time or something that we would want to display, or if we do just custom text and we put in nothing, it will look like this. Unfortunately, that is something that we might change in Alice, but we'll have it just display the timer value variable. So if I do this now, the world starts with 10, counts down. And there we go. We'll notice that it will just keep going forever. So it's gonna to go to a negative number. Um, an extension of that that you might wanna do would be to use a conditional statement. So again, the default being true. Uh, I can use, again, some math um, and that variable to extend it to say, all right, well, I only wanna have this fire if it is greater than zero. So I can do a, greater than, so if the timer variable is greater than zero, I want this to fire, and I will drag this up in there. Now we run this program. We will see what happens when we hit zero. And it will stop. So now we sort of used a variable to create a time variable we've created an event that is going to update that time variable. Um, we've set them at the scene class. Uh, we've set the, the whole number at the scene class so that we can access it inside uh, the initialize event listers. Did that make sense to everybody? Do they see how the variable is being used and how the variable is being updated? Um, this was an example of creating one at the scene level and then using the assign to update the value of it, and then just sort of an example of how we represent it. Um, again, you don't have to use a timer, like the, the text timer countdown. Maybe you've created some creative world where each time this would trigger and the value is updated, uh, you change the opacity or something like that to match. So set opacity to that number value. Um, so something would disappear over time. There's lots of creative applications of this. Everybody follow that one so far? All right, so I'm gonna show another way that you might wanna set this up. We are proponents of using custom procedures to make it so that if I continue to build lots of stuff into this page using event listeners, that it all doesn't just show up here and become one long program. So another thing you could to do would be to add a scene procedure that is increment time I set that one up, increment time, go to the initialize event listener. Using the clipboard, I can drag this up into there, go to this one, drag it in. So now we have that same logic in there. At the scene level, we have this increment time. Um, if I drag that into this event listener, now we have some simple code. This is where the logic of it is going to happen. And now I can run it. It will still function but we've got a little bit cleaner management of all the different events we want our program to have. All right, so another thing might be is I don't want this to just start the second I hit the run button because that's a little bit abrupt. We can create another variable that is um, timer on off. In this case, we're gonna use a Boolean variable because really it's either on or it's off. So it's going to be true or false. We are going to start it as false just because um, the whole goal of this is to make it so the timer doesn't just start right away. So coming back to our increment time procedure, we can now set up something where uh, we have two options, but I'm going to show you some deeper things. Uh, I could create an, another if um, container 
that was just, if that is true or false, we will run this other stuff. We do have the ability to make more complex, so we can do a both. So if both the timer is above zero and the timer on off variable is true, then we will do this. So uh, this is essentially saying, is it above zero? Is the timer set to on, or I guess is timer on true? So I could rename this variable uh, to timer on if we're gonna use it like this. So again, I'll come back and rename to just make it read a little better. So is the timer on is true and is above zero, then this will execute. Um, remembering that we set it as false to begin with. If I run this, nothing will happen. It will never start to count down. So we wanna switch this variable on and off. So we're gonna come back to the event listeners and let's say we'll add a keyboard. Um, so we'll do an add key press listener. We'll use any key for now, and we will say that when you press a key, first thing we'll do is we'll assign the timer on variable to true. If I run my code now, remembering that we are using the assign for the variable to set it, so taking a key press is going to trigger assigning the variable to true. When I run this, I'm now going to press the space bar. It will start our timer. So it is a great way to, I could have directions up there that says press spacebar to begin this game. Um, one of the things that will happen when I press that spacebar will be to turn the timer on. I could add other things in here um, and set other variables that increment as well. One thing that I will say that is another good idea to do, and so I'm gonna show you an example of this, is use a variable to um, set up your world. So. Scene activated is when I press play. You saw that in order to have the 10 show up um, and be the countdown for the variable, I have to set it here. Um, there's other things that would change. So right now, if I want to change the you know, duration of my game, if it's a game or something like that, um, I could come here and I can change the custom whole number to be 20. Now our timer, well, let's go shorter to three. Now our, our game is gonna be a lot shorter. If I run this world, we see that uh, the 10 is still displayed because that's what I set as the value for the text model. When I press spacebar, we jump down. And so it's not really updating both of those locations at the same time. Uh, something that we can do is we can create at the scene level, a sort of, uh, we'll call it world setup since this isn't quite a game. And I could do something where I assign the variable. Uh, so the timer, well, we'll just put it to three. And we could do a coming back to our timer display. We could do a set value. Uh, we remembering that you need to do this to access a whole number, we'll set it to the variable. I'm gonna come back and delete this out so that it doesn't show. So this is now our timer display update. Uh, world setup, if I run this, nothing happens obviously yet, but we can use a scene activated, so I'm not gonna complicate it that one for right now, but you could put it in there. We will say that on startup, I wanna set these variables, so I'm gonna do a scene activated listener. I'm gonna to go to this. I'm gonna have it call world setup. Remembering that world setup both sets the timer variable and then updates the display. Now if I run my world, there it is at three seconds and it also matches to when I press the space bar. Now if I wanted to change the difficulty or the duration of my game or what are the, the values of some variables I've set, I'd have a very clean place to come and do it. Um, so we could come here and say instead we want our game to be five seconds long. Again, when I open it up, it is already setting the value of that display, changing the variable to what I want it to be. And I can press spacebar and away we go. Uh, this can also then be extended and I'm throwing a bunch of stuff into this, but this is sort of from 
simple to uh, expand it on using a timer. Just wanted to show you all of these sort of different options. So we have the scene activated, setting up the world setup. We have the time event listener that is incrementing time. And then we have this key press that is toggling the turn on and off. Um, one thing you might want to do in a game or something else would be that when it hits zero, we want it to reset or have the option to press spacebar to reset or something like that. So another option we could do is in this key press is we can do um, a if, and remember this is sort of a Boolean, timer on and off is true, then it would be true. So that doesn't seem right. We want to say that if it's off, we want the key press to do that. So we have this option to do that opposite of a variable that is a Boolean. So if the timer is on is false, then this key press will um, reset that. So key press starts it. Um, I guess to prove that point, if I keep it in the key press, nothing's going to happen, partly just because we have an empty else. Uh, the other option is that we could make it so that if I hit the key press, it will uh, stop the timer. So let's do another assign. Now I have one that says that if it's on or if it's off, clicking a button will turn it on, which then means the opposite of that, if it is on, we can turn it off. If I run this world now, I can turn the time on and off by pressing the space bar. So this might be something that you want to do just to increment that game. Um, how would we do a reset? So we could do another one where if it's on, we do that. And if it's off, we set it to false. And then we can actually call this world setup again which will then reset our timer because we set those variables. So the first time I click it, we're counting down. Click it again, it reset it to the top. Uh, there's lots of different things you can play around with on that. Uh, you could make a conditional on if you've won or lost or if it's zero for the reset. Mm -hmm. There we go, where it counts down again. Did that make sense to everybody on using a Boolean to turn things on and off, using the timer variable to update a value, using some math to loop it through and increment it um, a little bit on setting up custom procedures? Again, we could do this um, and drag it into the clipboard and create another one that says um, game start um, reset or something like that and just have this set to one space bar or something like that for doing that. All right, well, then if we're gonna call that example good, I'm gonna show you another one um, that is gonna show you the sort of inheritance of variables when you set them at uh, object classes and things like that. We're gonna not save that, we'll come back here. All right, so in setup scene, I'm gonna go ahead and grab oh, a couple of different bi bipeds. So we've got Alice, we'll grab an alien, and we will grab a bat. So now imagine that we're making a game or something like that where, you know, everybody of this, uh, everybody has you know, a health, a speed, or some other thing. Imagine, um, I guess the easiest one is, is health or something of those lines or you know, collected or something like that, where each one of these we would want to manage separately. So one way you could do that is actually to create a variable for each of those uh, classes. So we've got Alice, alien, bat. We could set up a variable here that is called health. Um, or times clicked or something like that. Um, we're then doing sort of triple the work and we're limiting how we can access that and update it and change it. Um, if I go to the biped level, so we go to biped and I add a biped property and we'll call it times clicked. So 
with whole number and we'll initialize it as zero. All right, so now all bipeds have a version of this variable. And so by virtue of that, all instances of those um, classes, this other classes, so in this case, Alien, Alice, and the Bat will have one as well. So what does that mean? Uh, we're gonna come back to this and don't recommend moving stuff in this window, but you can. Uh, we're gonna set up a mouse click Add mouse click on object listener. Uh, remember that add details set of visuals would allow me to set up a custom array to limit it. We really only have these three objects, but I'll do it just for a refresh. We want it to work for Alice, the alien, and the bat. Now mouse clicks on all of those objects are gonna um, work. We see now that since we created that variable, we have this set times clicked. Um, if I were to drag this in here, we can do the same thing where we do that increment. So let's say that we did the bat, the bat is clicked. We can do, uh, This is an example of, so we're at the scene level. The variable that we created is at the biped level. So we can't just access that variable at the scene level. So what we need to do for this is use the function that is on that bat. So you see now we have get times clicked. Instead of doing what we did with the timekeeper where we put in the variable and we did the increment, you need to come here because we need to actually get that value from the biped class. So I can grab in here and do a bat gets time click plus one. I am going to go ahead and add, going back to our previous one, that we wanna visualize this variable change because otherwise we'll never see it. So we're gonna have them say hello, which we are going to again replace with hello plus a whole number. Again, we need to, if we want to do it here, replace with the get times clicked. I'm going to once again custom string this away. All right. So now when I click, and again, it is working for all of them because all of them are clickable, but you see that it's incrementing the value. Let's say that we wanted to prove that currently there is a times clicked variable being managed for each of these. We have only done the bat and we've had any of them uh, work for it. If I do this true, and we can do a comparison of an S thing when doing a mouse click. So we're gonna do the bat, bat. But really what we're trying to do is replace the model at mouse location. So let's say that if the bat is clicked, then we wanna have it do this one. Well, let's set up another one for each of the others so I can option click to duplicate. So if it's the bat, we want that to happen. If it is the alien, then instead of it being the alien time click that we're updating, we are going, or the bat, we are gonna update all of these to be alien. Now, if I run this program, if I click the bat, it will slowly increment. That is just incrementing the, the instance of that variable attached to this specific bat. If I click the alien, you'll see that it's a one. So we now have a four here and a one here. We've declared a variable exists for the biped class, um, but it is not just one. It is now available to all of those. So I can keep clicking the alien and we'll see that increment it will increment different than the variable that has been created for this instance of the bat. That one's a little bit harder to understand, but uh, can be really useful if I was going to do something where I wanted to set up um, a health, like I said, for a character, or times clicked, or objects collected, or something like that, and we wanted to manage it for multiple different things. Um, but they were all of the same class, instead of creating four different variables or three different variables in this case, one for each of those characters and then managing those separately. 
I can do this. Does that make sense? All right, I'm going to extend a, this. If a, a, another biped is added to the, um, to the scene, then it would um, also, and then we would just change the, uh, we would add it to this purple box, so this light blue box, and then we would just, that would ha also have the same properties. Correct. So this is one of those ones where it's like, I guess a, a game example of trying to understand this is, um, you know, when you talk about like Dungeons and Dragons or something like that, um, each of the different things will have, you know, a charisma, a health, a speed, those types of things. And you know that you want everybody to have those because it's going to impact like how they behave in the world or how much life they have or things like that. But each one is going to have a different one, and you might want to set them differently, but you know that everybody is going to have those same underlying properties. So this is sort of setting that up, saying that like, you know, all characters have a speed, a health, um, those types of things. And I just want to create sort of the template for that. And so I'm going to add all the different properties I know I'm going to want to set for any character in my world. And then I can go and, you know, using what we showed in the last lesson, a world setup. I can set those for each of the different ones based on what they want them to be um, because you know I don't want them all to be zero from the start, but I want them all to exist. So by doing this, I can create it, but I could do a world setup where I'd modify it for each one. One other thing I could do for that is again, if we're sort of going with the abstraction and things like that is I can make a increment click here. And again, now it's sort of this, this. So if I go back to here, we set the times clicked. Well, actually I can just sort of drag this whole thing over here. Uh, well. And again, now, you know, biped has no idea of aliens, so we want to set it to this. Um, well, I use that to carry it over, but we'll do away with that. So now we have this increment click um, that is based on which one it is. And so if we come back to initialize event listener, we now have in each one of these uh, a increment click. So instead of using this over and over again, uh, we could, because it's aware of that variable, we can use this function. Um, I wouldn't actually even need to do this. I could have used in this case, the actual variable. So because it's inside biped, I don't have to use a function to get it because I'm aware of that variable and then initialize in here, I could still do the uh, get model mouse location equals bat, but instead of writing that every time in case I want to change the behavior of that, now I could just use bat increment click. So now if I run this, it will still work, but we're using one that was created on the bat level. And so again, if this was more complicated logic that was using the variable it makes even more sense because instead of having a lot of code in here, I am only using sort of this custom procedure I made at the, at the biped level. And I guess just to be clear, you know, since we did it at the biped level, everybody got one of those. So then if it's the alien, the alien also has access to its own version of that increment click. So well, I guess I could have just edited that one, but, um, which is making use of not a shared variable, but its own. So I'm looking at the bat. We're now up to you know, five, six. The alien is still on its own saved value for its variable of four and five.
like I said, this summer, I'm hoping to have some grad students make some really just sort of simple game examples that use these mechanics. These are definitely ones that I know are, we do have how to's on our website. Um, we would like to update them and make them a little bit more um, obvious and verbose. I think the timer one that I just walked you all through is pretty straightforward. Uh, I can do it again, setting sort of, I guess the biggest one there is generally people will set something up to when it hits zero, it will trigger, you know, a you lost procedure, which can turn everything off and those types of things. Um, so I didn't sort of walk us all the way through using it in that capacity. Um, this here can be another whole one for, um, it could be items collected, you could set different variables um, in this manner that is just for collecting different items. And then you could set all kinds of conditions that, you know, if I collected four Alice's, three aliens, two bats, or something like that, that I win the game. And so potentially when I click on it, it teleports the bat somewhere else. And then I have to go find it again or things like that. But we would keep track of, you know, how many times that bat has been found or other creative ideas like that. And so I've seen a lot of them from our community and I'm hoping to have some other students create some, some good examples for us for that as well. Any other questions on variables or the examples I chose to show sort of the difference? Um, I think the two, the two I chose were really to show you um, setting up scene variables for the timer and then what it means in terms of if you set something at the biped level of not being able to access it directly at the scene level, but needing to use the, the functions um, and procedures to set and pass that data back and forth inside the biped class. Uh, so I hope that part was pretty, was made sense. Can you uh, activate more than one of the objects in the scene at the same time? Meaning, could I update both variables? No, could you activate the bat to start and while it's starting then start, the, while it's running, have the alien start while it's still running? Mm -hmm. Uh, let me here. We'll change the duration of this to be long enough for. Well, I think the thing that we have here, so it will run this and it's going to wait for increment click to be done we can do a multi-event policy that says combine, ignore, or queue. So I'm curious what will happen since it's like a 10 second wait time. This one will allow me to display them over top of each other. Is this what you were asking? Yeah, so they can be more than, more than one. Yeah, and a lot is, of these, uh, and, this and example... I will make another sort of how to and this multiple event policy is pretty important to keep track of and think about um, that timer event and some of the stuff that I was doing right before this, just to remind myself how to do it really quickly so I could walk you through it. Um, I created an example where I was doing the toggle on and off and was doing a reset. And one of the things that ended up happening was the multiple event policy for a key press was actually turning it on and off at the exact same time because we process a hold a held key so fast. Um, so sometimes if you're getting odd behavior and changing a variable or those types of things, um, since you're trying to trigger it just sort of once, especially for a Boolean or something like that, make sure that if you want it to only happen for each key press that you set this as fire once on press because our default, because people use it so much for arrow keys to run around and things like that, is to trigger it really quickly on a held key so they can do a bunch of those types of movements. Um, but when you're toggling a variable or something like that, you really don't want each key press to fire off over and over and over again. Um, so be aware of that for the fire once on press or even the ignoring and combining and things like that. 
might affect the way your program is is running, especially when sort of doing things like this. Will Will this example of what you have done be available on um, on Facebook? Um, I will get something up on our website. Um, no, with the timer, the timer, and and this. Yeah. So. Um, in our how to's, and again, these are ones that I've been wanting to replace for a while, but there's some links to some other teachers who have created some things. We do have a bunch of these in the interactivity section. So first person mm -hmm. camera, we have setting up a timekeeper and setting up a scorekeeper. I'm not super excited about how these ones are detailed and what I just showed you in terms of how I would separate the code is potentially a little bit different in where they set up the variable. Um, so I do want to refresh this and create a couple of different variations. So a timekeeper where it's just doing everything, creating it inside that event listener, the one where I've done the sort of custom procedures. So depending on what the students know, it'll you know give them an example of how to set it up. The scorekeeper, I will do a basic one, but then I'll also do um, once I can come up with a you know character example for this last one of using a biped or a flyer or something like that in a game example of a shared variable or an inherited variable rather. Um, I'll get something like that up there as well. Because yeah, I think these examples definitely help teach that lesson way better than talking through it because it doesn't really um, sink in of why it matters until you're trying to use it. And then all of a sudden it makes sense why you would want to put it at a different level, like where you would create your variable and why it matters. All right. Well, then um, that pretty much will wrap it up for this week. Um, thank you for joining. Thank you for watching this video. Yeah. Definitely some thank other ones that are needed to understand what we talked about today. So go back and watch those, check out some of the other lessons. Um, and like I said, I will post up some more of these to the how to's and try to create some other cool examples of why this will help you make what you want to make and get them up soon. So we will see you next week. If you join, join us, we'll talk about game design in Alice. So creating a game design document needed to wait till after this one, because so much of what I just showed you today is sort of required for creating win states. Um, game variables and things like that. So join us next week for that.